My name is Rissel Swanson with Physical Therapist. Um, this in service is speaking Spanish, basics for outpatient physical therapists. So this presentation is adapted from basic Spanish grammar and vocabulary for physical therapy evaluation and treatment by Sarah Pullen, PT, DPT, MPH, CHES. Um, so she is an assistant professor at Emory University School of Medicine. Her research focuses on developing and implementing physiotherapy protocols and interve interventions for people living with HIV, AIDS, and underserved areas. She has experience in the provisions of health services to underserved communities abroad and especially in Latin America. 2015, she received the IPT, HOPE award from World Congress of Physical Therapy for her work in the field of HIV and physiotherapy. Um, so she's someone who's very credited and is fluent in Spanish. And so I adapted her presentation from physicaltherapy.com to be more specific to our outpatient clinic here. An outline for the presentation includes the objectives, um, interpretive services available here at Yelma Haven Hospital, Spanish basics, including grammar, vocabulary, common phrases that we can utilize in our clinic specifically, and lifting, since it's also a lot of um, treatment that we do here at our clinic. And lastly, anatomy. Objectives to this in-service include, it will assist you in communicating with Spanish-speaking patients for follow-up visits. You will be able to correctly state in Spanish how to ask a patient to rate their pain on the numerical pain rating scale. You will be able to correctly list in Spanish the basic anatomical terms such as major body parts and bones of the skeleton. You will be able to form formally address a patient by introducing yourself in Spanish and by identifying your discipline to the Spanish-speaking patient. In Spanish, you will be able to ask a patient basic questions about ambulation such as can you walk independently, or do you require an assistive device? Lastly, in Spanish, you will be able to state at least three instructions related to the exercise program given to your patient. This slide is about language assistance that's available at Yale New Haven Hospital specifically. Um, I wanted to include this first and foremost because I think it's most important to always use an interpreter when you have concerns for patient safety or when there is no or limited understanding of English for the patient, um, especially during initial evaluations when you're obtaining the most information for the patient. I think that's a time when you always want to use an interpreter. In interpretive services available at Yale, um, they provide services and assistive equipment for patients who have difficulty understanding, speaking, and also reading English and it's the patient's right to have a qualified interpreter, which is guaranteed by hospital patient rights, the Joint Commission regulations, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and Connecticut state law. So Yelma Haven Hospital is required to provide interpreters and or assistive devices to enable communication, deaf and hard of hearing, to translate vital documents into the most frequently used languages and have interpreters for patients and their companions who have a language preference other than English. So you always want to be providing this service to patients when they come in. The modes of language access available are in person, over the phone, and there's video remote interpretations. Spanish and ASL is available through video monitors or iPoles. Um, which they have in the main hospital, but not um, specifically in our clinic. In our outpatient clinic, the language services available would be from any phone. We do have the two specific cordless hand, like a handset phone to use, but if you need to call a patient who does not speak English, such as reminding them of an appointment, you can dial 111 from any of the hospital phones to get an interpreter. So it's important to use that service as well when we're just sitting at our computers and need to call a patient. We can automatically get an interpreter on our phones. And this is just a slide to tell you of the, the process, what to dial, and how to get the interpreter, how to document it. So 
So most of the time at our clinic, I'd say we use the interpreter phones um, with patients, um, Spanish and other languages. But there are times where um, maybe there's going to be a whole family involved, or we've had patients who are also um, deaf or hard of hearing as well as cannot speak English. So you can also um, request an interpreter in person. Um, so it's something that you have to set up in advance um, for the patient. Um, you can go via EPIC. You can go on the internet. Go to Yale New Haven Applications and Language Service Request. Um, and this slide tells you the time that they're available. Um, you can also call the department and get more specific information. But we would set that up in advance. We usually do that with the front desk. And they set up all their appointments, well, that the um, language services know when to send the interpreters. So this slide is fast facts on Spanish. Um, you may be wondering why we chose Spanish to review for physical therapy when there are also other common languages. So I want to include some facts that um, show that it's highly likely that we'll encounter a Spanish-speaking patient in our career as a PT, especially in our area. So first, according to the 2013 U.S. Census, um, in the U.S. there are 38.4 million residents who speak Spanish at home. Um, 22.3 million, or 8.4 percent, have a limited English proficiency. They also showed that non-English speakers are less likely to return for follow-up appointments. And there's also a higher rate of drug complication and hospitalizations. More specific to our area in New Haven, the Census Bureau in 2010 showed that 27.4% identified as Hispanic or Latino. So just in our area, the population is higher of patients that we see coming in. And I'm sure if I asked around the room, we'd have at least one patient per person per week that speaks Spanish, whether it's um, they have limited English or they're proficient in both Spanish and English. So these next few slides are going to be kind of a basic overview of the Spanish language. Um, if you ever took Spanish in uh, grade school or high school or college, they'll be very familiar to you, but that was important just to go over as the rest of um, the in-service is going to be specifically speaking in Spanish, so kind of want to review that. Um, so basic sounds, the vowels are different. There's still A, E, I, O, U, but the A sounds like A. Ah. E sounds like A. I sounds like E. O is the same in Spanish and English. And U sounds like U. So in Spanish, that's A, A, E, O, U. The extra letters in the Spanish alphabet are also a little bit different. They sound differently. So there's an N with um, what they call a tilde over it. And it sounds like Enye. And when you encounter double L's, it sounds like Ya. Like in case of Dia or Rodilla, which is me. Um, other things to note that in Spanish the H is silent. So if you're saying Avar, which is spelled H-A-B-L-A-R, you're saying Ablar. Also, when there's a double R, you sort of roll the R sound with your tongue. So, such as the word perro, P-E-R-R-O, would be perro. And a lot of times you have to practice it because it doesn't come naturally if you're not a Spanish speaker. I also included a slide on here about time because one thing that we're always doing is making patients appointments and or reminding them of their next appointment. So it's something simple that's good to know, um, just so you can kind of tell them offhand, but also why you're going to hand them the paper so they can also have it in writing. So you can see on the graphic on the right, okay, what I ask is what time is it? So you can see from the clock, um, the only exception is going to be when you're telling them 1 o'clock. You would say, es la una. All the other one, one starts, son las dos, son las tres, son las cuatro. So that's how you're going around the time until you get to noon. 
You can also tell them we would use two times either in the morning or in the afternoon. So you would tell them what time the appointment is, de la mañana, in the morning, or de la tarde, in the afternoon. Okay, so let's do an example. So to tell a patient that your appointment is at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, you'd say la cita, your appointment, es a la una de la tarde. Another thing to note with time, you can tell them like on the half hour would be y media. So if you're going to say 2.30, say son las dos y media. Um, if you're doing quarter past, like 3.15, you would say son las tres y cuarto, or tres y quince. But then when you're telling time to the Spanish speaker, when you're going past the half hour, you're actually going to be counting back from 60 minutes. So instead of saying like 12.45, you'd be saying it's 1 o'clock minus 15 minutes. A little confusing, but it just takes some practice. So to say that they have a 1.45 appointment, you would say, son las dos menos quince minutos. So you can kind of refer to that slide just to keep practicing that. Okay, this next slide is pretty simple, but it's something good to practice. So it's the days of the week and the months of the year. So you make sure you want to be telling the patients what day they're coming in and that you're saying the right day. <laughs> so this starts Sunday, Domingo, Monday, Lunes, Tuesday, Martes, Wednesday, Miércoles, Thursday, Jueves, Friday, Viernes, and Saturday, Sabado. The months of the year, January is Enero, February is Febrero, March is Marzo, April is Abril, May is Mayo, June is Junio, July is Julio, August is Agosto, September is Septiembre, October is Octubre, November is Noviembre, and December is Diciembre. Again, it's just something you need to practice so that it kind of becomes second nature. Okay, so I tried to make these slides a little bit fun so it's not so dry with vocabulary. So I put the count on here because it's something that we as therapists do all the time. As we're counting out the seconds, we're counting out um, exercise repetitions. So I just wanted to include this slide to kind of tell you the specifics of counting to 10, 20, 30, 40, up to 100. I don't think I'm ever giving anyone numbers above 100. <laughs> but I put it on there, this um, graphic shows up to a thousand. Okay, going back to the counting slide, I just want to reiterate with um, counting that it gets pretty repetitive, which makes it easy. So you start with the uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, diez, and that's one through ten. Um, 11 through 19 is going to be a little bit different, and then you kind of see the pattern as you go past that. So then you have 11 starts 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 is 20. But then once you get to 20, which is 20, then you start again where you're just saying 20. Technically, it says 20 plus 1, so 20 y 1. So then you'd start over again, 20 y 2, 20 y 3. So then when you go to 30, which is 30, then you're doing 30 y 1, 30 y 2. So you can kind of see the pattern, 40, 40, 50, 50, 60, 60, 70, 70. So then you would do, say, 80, 80, 85, 80, y 5, and 100 is 100. Okay, in the next slide, I included um, La Familia in Espanol, so the family in Spanish. Because um, oftentimes, um, if a patient comes in, they might bring a family member because they feel more comfortable or um, 
maybe the patient can help them with their home program, but just to help them kind of understand more of what's going on. So I really wanted to include members of the family that you would either see them coming in with or that maybe they'd be talking about during their time in therapy. So just to be familiar with the vocabulary and the relationships is important. Um, I'll start on the right. Miembros de familia. They're talking about their spouse. You say esposa, which is a feminine, or esposo. A partner, pareja. Uh, the mother, madre, father, padre. Their sister is hermana. Her brother is hermano. Child is hija or hijo. Niece or nephew is sobrina or sobrino. Aunt or uncle is tia or tío. And a grandparent is abuela or grandma or abuelo is grandpa. And a granddaughter or a grandson is nieta or nieto. And also, I have mentioned this before, um, if it's female relative, it's going to be ending in A. If it's male, it's going to be ending in O. Um, and then you can see on the family tree, it kind of breaks it down a little bit for people who are maybe more visual learners, learners to see the grandparents at the top, abuela and abuela, their hijos or their children, um, or there. And you can see it breaks it down to um, the person's parents or padres. And then um, the child, the hijo or hija, and their brother and sisters, so they'd be hermano and hermano. And so then the parents' siblings would be the tia or tío, aunt and uncle, and their children are their cousins, so primo or prima. Again, with any of the vocabulary, it's just something to review and familiarize yourself with. Okay, now we're getting into some more PT specifics. So we're talking about anatomy. So the first slide looks at the bones or huesos. And don't get it confused with huevos, which means eggs. Had that happen before. <laughs> um, and the good news is with a lot of the bones or different body parts, um, they're derived from Latin. So a lot of Spanish has Latin roots. So it's going to sound very familiar to kind of what we're used to in terms of the bones, which makes it a little bit easier. So sometimes I've found even if I forget or don't know the name of a specific bone or body part um, in terms of anatomy, that the patient will know what I'm saying because it sounds very similar, such as the clavicle la clavicula. So the patient sounds familiar to them, or the scapula is the scapula. Um, so just I'll just go through the bones really quick. Um, the graphic should be kind of easy to see. If not, you might have to zoom in or make it bigger somehow. So we have the ribs, costillas, sternum, sternum, lumbar vertebrae, las vertebras, lumbares, pelvis, la pelvis, sacrum, el sacro, the hip bone, el hueso iliaco, coccyx, el coccyx, um, let's see, um, the phalanges, the phalanges, fibula, el perone, tibia, la tibia, patella, is rotula. So, maybe familiarize with yourself with that one because it's not too common, rotula. Um, what else? So, the ulna, cubito, radius, el radio, humerus, humero. So, as I said, you can see how some of them are very similar to how we would say them. The next slide is looking at the external anatomy, which is usually, unless you're talking about bones in terms of a fracture or something really specific, you're probably going to be using the external anatomy terms when you're um, describing something to a patient or you're pointing to a body part or they're communicating with you about a body part. So I want to go over first the front, where the, the man in the picture is facing us. So you have the forehead is the frente, eye is ojo, nose is nariz, ear is oreja, mouth is la boca, neck, el cuello, 
shoulder, it's an um, ombro. And um, this is a funny story um, that happened at our clinic. Someone was meant to say shoulder, ombro, but they said ombre, and the patient was just laughing because it kind of like a slang for a man. So I found that funny. So just be careful with those words that can sound like something else. Um, other common words that you'd use are chest would be pecho, um, armpit, axilla, abdomen, abdomen, uh, stomach, estomago, by muslo, mi rodilla, leg is pierna, foot is al pie, toes, dos dedos do pie. Um, and something for the leg, when you say la pierna, Sometimes I'll point, like if I mean lower around the tibia or higher around the thigh area, because I often find that it's such a general term that folks kind of think it's both. So I find that pointing helps be a little bit more specific. Um, and then to the right of the screen where the patient is seeing their back. Um, some other terms are head, cabeza, air, bello, um, throat. Is garganta, uh, forearm, antebrazo, um, elbow is el godo, back is la espalda, the waist is la cintura, hip is la cadera, wrist is muñeca, hand is la mano, fingers los dedos de la mano, and the buttocks is la nalga. And I would say use that term when you're describing the buttocks because there are a few slang terms that you don't want to use. So definitely use that um, anatomical term. Um, for the calf, um, you can think of kind of a pant leg because the uh, Spanish word is pantorilla. So like I was talking about when you say la pierna for the leg, if you want to be more specific to the calf, pantorilla is what you would use. And then also the heel, talón. An ankle is el tobillo. Um, so this isn't, you know, a very exhaustive list. You'd have to kind of look it up online um, to other specific body parts. But I would say this is very common to what I would see in our practice when I'm um, describing things to patients or asking them um, where the pain is or to bend a certain body part. The next slide I'll go through really quick. I specifically wanted to include the graphic on the left with the hand. This is Patres de la Mano because we do have a certified hand therapist at our clinic, so I just wanted to kind of look at la mano, la hand, more specifically um, than just saying the hand because there are different really specific parts that you're asking the patient to use and to describe. So you have the palm, it's la palma, the finger, as el dedo, the fingernail, la uña, um, and the wrist, la muñeca, and the thumb, el pulgar. Um, I've also heard patients use, say, for the thumb, el dedo gordo, which means the big finger. <laughs> um, so when you're speaking about the different digits, you can also point el dedo and point to, you know, the first, second, third, or fourth digit. This next section of the in-service is useful vocabulary phrases in the clinic. Um, and then skipping to the next slide, I included some important phrases that we use with these patients. Um, I'm not going into specifics on um, verbs and conjugating verbs because it's just very complex and detailed for the time that we have and the scope that we're doing this presentation on. Um, but I did want to note that it is more formal when you're speaking to patients in the clinic to use the ending for usted instead of tu when speaking to a patient. It's more respectful and proper to use in the clinic um, versus, um, so you can see the endings would be like for hablar, would be habla, instead of hablas. Um, or if you ask them to repeat, or it says repite, por favor, repita, por favor. Um, it's not repitas. Um, yes, you are talking just to the patient, but doing the ending in just the A um, makes it more formal so that they're going to feel just more respected and more valued. So that's um, what you'll see 
I'm using through the rest of the presentation when I'm talking about speaking to a patient. So I'll quickly go through these phrases. Um, asking a patient, habla inglés. Do you speak English? Um, I'll say this oftentimes so that they know and feel a little bit more comfortable. I'll say hablo un poco de español. I speak a little Spanish. Um, or um, I'll tell them no entiendo or no comprendo, which means I don't understand. Um, sometimes I find um, patients speak really fast, even if I tell them I only speak a little bit Spanish. So sometimes I'll need them to um, repeat it and say, repita por favor. Or tell them to slow down, say, más despacio por favor. And say, more slowly, please. Um, sometimes I'll apologize, lo siento, say if I don't understand. Say, lo siento, no entiendo so that they know to repeat themselves. And it's, again, it's more respectful. Um, different phrases you might hear them, you might say or hear them use ahora is now, um, hoy, today. Pues, like if someone's thinking about how they're feeling, they might say pues, it's kind of like a, an um or an okay. Next we have patient physicians, which is really important in the clinic because we're always asking patients to get up or down or lay this way or that way. So if that review needs would be very essential to what we do at the clinic. So you're saying up, arriba, down, abajo. And these I find are really good cues when you're asking them to go supine or prone. So supine, you say boca arriba. So you're really saying mouth up. And prone, you're saying boca abajo, which is mouth down, which is a a better cueing, I think, for them than kind of lying on your back or lying on your stomach. Um, also, on the left side, lado izquierdo. The right side, lado derecho. Um, I don't use anterior and posterior as much when talking to a patient, but they're pretty much the same in Spanish and English. It just sounds a little bit differently. Anterior, anterior, posterior, posterior. Um, you might say in front or in back. In front is el frente and back is atrás. Um, I found if I'm doing a manual muscle test on a patient, um, say on the leg, I'm asking them to flex their knee. Um, I say atrás, they'll know to pull backwards. So I find that cueing is a little bit more helpful if I'm asking them to do that. Um, also under the bajo de on top of is encima de, and both sides, ambos lados. So if you're asking to repeat on both sides, you can say, repita, ambos lados. Um, I've also found with patient physicians, um, if you're asking them to, say, straighten or extend their knee, um, you say, derecho, and they'll know kind of to cue for them to straighten it. But it's also a little bit confusing because the right side is also lado derecho. Um, but you can also demonstrate to the patient what, what you want them to do. Um, this next slide is commands that we would typically use in the clinic um, with the patient exercise program or just something like, if, you know, I want to keep the door opened or closed if they're going to be on a modality. Um, so I've included a lot of um, common commands that we have here. Again, it's not an exhaustive list. You can look them up online or for some, um, for other list of maybe common phrases that you would use in your clinic. But things here like bend, doble, close, cierre, open, abra, come here, venga aquí, and continue, continue, do this. Haga esto. Stand up, parece. Get up, levantese. I'm going to ask them to lift a body part, for example. He said, suba. To lower a body part, for example. Baje. To walk, camine. Um, to maintain or hold something, se mantenga. Um, to extend, extienda. To lift. So this lift, it's kind of similar to 
to lift Suba to Levante. Um, I typically find I use Levante if I'm asking them to like lift their body off the table or, or to get up. Um, move is Mueva. Sit is Siéntese. And rest is Descanse. This next slide is a practice slide. Um, so I had everyone at the in-service kind of practice and say um, the blanks out loud so that they can practice. So I'll just um, give you the answers. <laughs> um, so first is, how would you say to move their arm? Say, por favor, mueva el brazo izquierdo así. Next, you're going to ask them to bend their arm and maintain the position. Say, por favor, doble el brazo así y mantenga la posición. Next, you want to ask them to extend their knee. So you're saying, extienda la rodilla derecha lo más que pueda. Lo más que pueda is as much as you can. So for more practice, um, how would you say these phrases? Please rest a minute. Please stand up. Please raise your leg. And please walk now. Um, so for the please aspect, I mean, it's just, you know, more formal when you use a command to a patient. And for the please part, it's sort of like how you would say in English, you can use it at the beginning or the end of the phrase or sentence. So I can tell someone to please rest for a minute. Or I can say, rest for a minute, please. So it's okay where you're putting that please part in Spanish, which is por favor. So to say please rest for a minute, you say por favor. Descanso por uno minuto. You can also say, Descansa por uno minuto, por favor. Um, next, please stand up. Por favor, parece. Please raise your leg. And here I'm going to use for raise. You can either use the um, levanta or suba. So say, por favor, levanta su pierna. O por favor, suba su pierna. Or please walk now. Let's say, por favor, camine ahora. So these are just a few examples to practice with, just using the commands in an exercise program. So the next few slides are going to sort of be some more kind of helpful vocabulary to use in the clinic, whether it's things that you'd say to the patient or things you would hear them saying. And so the first one I included was some useful adjectives. Um, so I got a lot of these adjectives from the presentation um, that I had adapted this from and also looked up some um, online as well that um, were not as common that I might hear in the clinic. Um, so you can read these on your own, but things that I found that were um, kind of important and specific to PT were things like you might hear dizzy, mareado, um, or numb, um, falta de sensación, or entumecido. So those are some pretty uncommon words that you might hear. Um, some other things would be like if their leg is swollen, hinchado. If it's painful, you might hear dolor or doloroso. Um, different things to ask them would be if an exercise is difficult or easy. Is it difícil or fácil? Um, if you are um, telling them how they're progressing, you can say strong, fuerte, or weak, débil. Um, or just ask them if they're tired, cansado, or cansada. This next slide is adverbs and prepositions. So these are some kind of easier things to know, but are important in this kind of everyday conversation with the patient. Um, so after, después de, again, otra vez, um, against, contra, alone, solo, always, siempre, before, antes de, deep is profundo, fast is rápido, first is primero, for is para. In or on is in, less or fewer is menos, 
more is ma, never is nunca, now is a hora or ahorita, of from is day, on or about is sobre, only is solamente, slowly is despacio, then is luego, to or at is a, very is muy, well, bien, um, or could also mean good, with is con, and without is sin. So these are some things you might hear, um, well actually things I would more likely say to a patient, like I'm asking them to do an exercise again, I'd say otra vez, or if they're going too slow, I'd say mas rápido, faster. Um, or if they're describing to me their pain, they might say always or siempre. Um, sometimes I, they also do an exercise too fast, so I'd say despacio, slowly, or más despacio, it's more slowly. Um, so these are just things that I feel are helpful in the clinic, and they're just quick words to know during the exercise program. Okay, the next two slides I included are common nouns that we find in physical therapy. Um, again, it's not an exhaustive list. I just found they were ones that um, are common that we use in our clinic that I might want to say to a patient or that I might hear from a patient um, that will just kind of help them be more familiar. Um, things like, um, also talk a little bit more about assistive devices after Bart Rowan Walker, Anadera con Ruedas, um, Splint, Barula, Something like a step would be escalon. A whole staircase would be escalera. Um, table, mesa, if I'm asking them to go on and off the table. Um, electrical stimulation, estimulo electrica. Exercise, ejercicio. Um, I find that it's um, bed or table for what we use in the clinic kind of interchangeable when I ask a patient. It kind of is more like a table, but sometimes gamma works the same. Um, bathroom is el baño. Balance is balance. Um, what else? Um, different things, like if you're um, asking them to change. La ropa is clothes. If you're asking them to put on a gown, it would be a camisón or a well bata. Uh, if you're asking them to take off their shoes, you would call them zapatos. Um, and also for um, a weight, if you're asking them to pick up like a, a free weight or a dumbbell, it's called a libra. And then sometimes I'll also um, use the same term if I'm um, using a gym equipment machine, like the leg press, I'll say how many libras um, they are. So you can kind of look at um, the nouns in here, if you want to familiarize yourself with other vocabulary words I haven't mentioned. Um, so the next slide is the common nouns in physical therapy. I label it part two, because it didn't all, all fit in that one slide, because there's so many um, vocabulary words to know. <laughs> so um, also included here were some things that I might use that are not, I'm not commonly using, but I'm using once in a while that's good to know, such as a fracture, fractura, a headache, dolor de cabeza, um, high blood pressure, presión alta or hipertensión, um, nausea, nausea, um, numbness, the falta de sensación. I think we discuss that in another slide. Um, pillow, almohada. Sometimes I might ask a patient if they need another pillow. Um, tingling. So this is an, another new one. Cosquillo. Um, so that'd be another way to describe it. Um, I've also heard um, through the interpretive services like um, corriendo, which is like a, like it's kind of like a, a running sensation. They may talk about that, like up and down their leg, that feeling. Um, treadmill, rueda de andar. Ultrasound, otro sonido. Um, so again, that's one of those words that you can say ultrasound and it sounds very similar to Spanish. Um, weight, peso. Um, I know the last slide I talked about libra, but I found the patient responds 
the same to peso or libra. Cane, um, castaña, or baston. I typically hear patients say baston when talking about a cane. Um, crutches is muletas. Okay, the next slide is ownership. So it's something real quick to express ownership in Spanish. You say that is of the person, so de. So Maria's doctor, la doctora de Maria, the doctor of Maria. Um, Julio's leg, la pierna de Julio. Um, your arm, su brazo. Again, we're using that formal su instead of to. Um, my right knee, mi rodilla derecha. Your left arm, su brazo izquierdo. Um, it also notes here that the adjective comes after the noun, so that's good to know. So how would you say your back? Su espalda. Maria's left knee. La rodilla izquierda de Maria. So you can practice those on your own. Um, I included this next slide called Praising Your Patients. Um, we have a therapist, Nick, here who um, just loves using excelente, bien, or um, just different things to encourage his patients. So I wanted to include some of these because we do want to encourage patients when they're um, doing something well or we're excited about their progress. Um, so different things are bien hecho, as well done. Excelente, excellent. Perfecto, it's perfect. Muy bien. Very good. Um, mejor is better. Mejor que antes is better than before. Or mejor que ayer is better than yesterday. So these are some good phrases you can use when you're praising a patient on doing well. Okay, the next um, segment is history and examination. Um, the next time, greeting your patient, introducing yourself is very important. Um, when you're not only when you're seeing a patient for the first time, if you're um, meeting a family member or just to welcome them into the clinic. Um, when they come in. So some basics would be like Buenos dias, it's good morning. Buenos tardes, it's good afternoon. Um, if I don't know if, how many people would be treating at night, um, that'd be Buenos noches. <laughs> um, hola is hi, which is more informal. So you probably want to say rather good morning, good afternoon. Um, ask them their name. Como se llama usted? To tell them your name. Say, me llamo. Or mi nombre es. Let's say, mi nombre es Rosel. So, me llamo es Rosel. It's a pleasure to meet you. Mucho gusto. Um, igualmente, it's likewise. So you'd probably hear that from the patient when you're telling them that it's a pleasure to meet them. So you're familiar with that. And then you want to introduce your discipline. Um, so I'm just using the physical therapist here. I'd say, soy la physioterapista. Or you can also say, physioterapeuta, B-E-U-T-A. And then um, to ask them, typically we'll ask them how they're doing or how they're feeling. So, como esta hoy? How are you today? You hear sorts of different responses. Maybe yo estoy bien, I'm good, or yo no estoy bien, I'm not good. Um, ¿Cómo se siente hoy? How do you feel today? Um, so you hear you know, a variety of responses. Sometimes it'll tell you a lot of information, and you'll need to kind of ask them más despacio, a little bit slower, or no entiendo, I don't understand. Um, but some typical responses might be, me siento bien. They say, I feel good. They might also say things like, Excelente, excellent, bueno, it's good, bien, well, muy bien, very well, mejor, it's better, un poco, it's a little bit, they might say un poco mejor, a little bit better, um, mucho, a lot, mucho mejor, but they might also say, um, just negative, they might say um, malo, which is bad, or peor, which is worse, um, so they might say un poco peor, a little bit worse, mucho peor. It's a lot worse. So just to kind of note their response to the question. So usually I'll ask the patient when they come in, say, ¿Cómo se siente? How are you feeling? Um, 
other things, which would be, if you want to be a little more specific, um, would be, tienes algún síntoma, which is asking them, do you have any symptoms? Which I find helps them to focus more on the symptoms rather than ask them how they are today. They might just talk about their day and not something specific to what they're here at the clinic for. Um, and then also asking them, te gustaría un interprete? That's would you like an interpreter? Because you always want to offer that to the patient to make them feel more comfortable. Um, I find a lot of patients will say, kind of know on some of the follow-ups if we're just doing exercise or they're more familiar with their program. Um, but then, um, personally, I always will um, start off with the interpreter when I'm doing a progress report on a patient because I know we're going to be going a little bit more in-depth with their program and that they're going to be giving me a little bit more complex responses than I'm used to. So it's really using your clinical judgment, but also making sure the patient is always comfortable with that decision that you're making to use an interpreter or not. You always want to ask them, because even if it's a follow-up and they want the interpreter, use it every time that they want one so that they are comfortable. This next section is also important. It's the pain scale. Um, so I included two pain scales on here. The first one is the Wong Baker Faces Pain Rating Scale, and this one is translated into Spanish. Um, so sometimes if the patient is having a hard time understanding the 0 through 10, um, numeric scale. You can show them the faces to kind of help those who are more visual, maybe learners, under people understanding. Um, so you can see the zero, sin dolor, is without pain. Um, the one, un poco de dolor, a little bit of pain. Two, un poco más de dolor, a little bit more pain. Three, aún más dolor, which is translates to yet more pain. A uh, four, mucho dolor. A uh, five is, um, mucho is a lot of pain. Five, el dolor is a más intenso. So the pain is the most intense. And that correlates to, obviously, the, the crying. Um, the next one is the typical pain scale I'd ask someone on initial visit and then follow-up visits to do the zero to ten scale to quantify their pain. Um, so to ask them so this is a translation here in Spanish of what I would ask them on how much pain do you have in a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 is no pain and 10 is the worst, what number is the pain that you have right now? They say, ¿Cuánto dolor tiene? Es una escala de 0 y 10. Si 0 es no dolor y 10 es el peor. ¿Qué número es el dolor que usted tiene o jura? So I also kind of want to emphasize the aura portion, the now, um, because some people will kind of stay in such that high pain scale, um, thinking about the kind of their trajectory or their path of where their pain is. So getting them to focus on like, where they are when they're making progress um, will kind of help you get a better um, sense of where they are with the changing or with any patient if you know, they've been at an 8 to 10, but I've seen some objective progress. Um, I might say to them, you were, you know, at an 8 at this point, you know, four weeks ago, but you weren't able to do A, B, and C, and now you can. Um, and then kind of seeing if they say, okay, well, you know, maybe I'm at a 6 now, we're not an 8. So I think that's important with any patient. The next slide is physical exam. I didn't go into too much detail here because there was a lot to include. Um, I just included some phrases here in Spanish and translating to English of things you might kind of say or, or do during an exam. Um, for example, may I examine your back? Or they're examining on su espalda. Or I'm going to touch your foot. Voy a tocar su pie. Um, now I'm going to look at your posture. Ahora voy a mirar a su postura. Or questions you might ask. What is this scar? Que es esta cicatriz? Patient might respond. It's from my back surgery. Es de mi cirugía de espalda. 
Um, so it's more just kind of combining some of the things that we have said in past slides, talking about um, um, using that formal um, greeting when we're talking to them with the SU and the AH endings, um, doing the specific body parts, um, asking questions, um, asking them for clarification, um, making sure that you're asking, you know, for consent or letting them know what you're doing. And they examine something, I'm going to do this, and then waiting so that you see that they understand. Okay, this next slide I also included to be aimed at our clinic because we do show patients how to use the stairs, which is stepping up and down for um, after different injuries. So some questions about stair use. You might ask a patient, can you go up and down the steps? Se puede subir y bajar los escalones. Their response could be, yes, but it is difficult. Sí, pero es difícil. Other questions you might ask, do you need a handrail? Necesita usted un pasamano. The next slide is questions about assistive devices. It's also important whether you're just asking them during their initial visit um, what they use at home, or if you're trying to teach them how to use a certain device, you would want to know these vocabulary words. So the beginning says, usted usa, or do you use? Um, some quick vocabulary, walker, una anadera, cane, un bastón, crutches, las muletas, wheelchair, una silla de ruedas, which is basically a seat with wheels. So you might ask them, usted usa una bastón en su casa? Do you use a cane in your home? Um, and then you want to ask them how often they're using it. Usa todo el tiempo? So are you asking them, are you using it all the time? And their responses could be varied, um, a veces, at times, siempre, is always, nunca, is never, or afuera, afuera, is outside. So those are some responses you might um, get from them, or sometimes I find that I might prompt them um, kind of to find out if they use it outside or inside, or how often they are using assistive device. Um, and then a question about the wheelchair that was important. Do you use a wheelchair without help? Usa la silla de ruedas sin ayuda. So I would also tell you kind of where their functional level is at and how much assist they're getting. Um, and then asking them questions about how long they use it for. Um, this is very helpful in setting goals as well. So por cuánto tiempo puede? So how long can you? And so you might ask to do a certain, certain thing. So how long can they walk? Camina. Um, how long can they sit? Sentarse. Um, stand. Estar de pie. Work. Trabaja. So you're kind of asking them some leading questions. Um, and then other things you might ask if they're having pain with it. Con dolor. Or without pain. Sin dolor. Uh, the next slide just has pictures of different assistive devices just to kind of go over the vocabulary words that we just used in the last slide. Um, so going from left to right, you have your crutches, um, la muletas, las muletas, and we have the wheelchair, una silla de ruedas, the cane, la bastón, and the walker, un anadera. Um, una anadera could be just a general walker without the wheels. Um, it can be more specific, una anadera con ruedas. So a walker with wheels is when you might indicate the little wheels on the front. Um, I don't know if there's a term for, you know, a rollator where they would, the type of kind of device where they have a little seat where they sit on. Um, you might just have to show them a picture or kind of say the anadera con ruedas again with wheels and um, kind of gauge their response to that. Okay, the next slide um, is phrases to use that are specific to our clinic. Um, before doing the in-service, I had emailed the therapist at our clinic and kind of asked what are some 
common phrases that they use that they'd want to know in Spanish. So it would be helpful to know from just a day-to-day -day perspective in communicating with Spanish-speaking patients. So these here are some of their responses. Um, I also make these available to the therapists at our clinic to kind of reference and to practice so that, you know, kind of becomes second nature. Um, so for other therapists listening, um, these might not apply to your specific clinic, such as kind of where a bathroom is located or like, you know, different modalities you're using or we have a bell, like little service bells that we use here if a patient is uncomfortable or something's too hot or they need something. So you might use a different method for that. So you think of another common phrase to translate to be beneficial. So to go through this list, um, we have the bathroom. It's the first one on your right. El baño es la primera puerta a la derecha. Exit is the first one on your right. La salida es la primera puerta a la derecha. Or if you're saying to the left, depending on where they are in the clinic, a la izquierda. We often ask patients after the treatment if they're on heat or a modality, um, would you like the lights on or off? Te gusta la luces encendida o apagado. We also give them the bell like I was describing, asking them if they need anything to please ring the bell. Si necesitas algo, por favor sueña la campana. Also, you want them to tell you if the heat is too hot, which is a reason why they would want to ring the bell. Dime si el calor es demasiado caliente. And also, when they are finished, you want to let them know that they can leave and that they're finished with their session today. So, terminamos con la sesión de hoy. Also, you want to distinguish that with some of their last day and you're discharging them. Son dados de auto de terapia física. Esta es su última sesión. So, saying you're discharging physical therapy, it's your last session. Another common question we always want to ask is if they have more appointments. We want to make sure that they are attending all their follow-ups. At the beginning of the presentation, I was kind of describing the, the fact that the majority of patients who are not English-speaking um, have very poor kind of follow-up with instructions or attendance just because of the language barrier. So you want to ask, Dani, Masitas, do you have more appointments? And then we also have um, a system where we kind of write how many visits and the frequency and duration on paper to bring to the front desk. So we'd say, bring this paper to the receptionist to make more appointments. Lleve este papel a la recepcionista para hacer citas más. So this is the last section of the presentation. It focuses on lifting. And I did this um, to be specific to our clinic again because we do a lot of workers' compensation patients or just see people who injure their back with poor body mechanics, whether it be at home or at work. So we um, want to reinforce proper body mechanics. And so I wanted to just translate some things for the therapists here to kind of help them go through the process of explaining to patient proper lifting and how to demonstrate that to them. Okay, the slide is lifting vocabulary. So some common words that you would be using when you're discussing with them. You want to approach an object, so acercar, or you're saying to the patient, hacer, hacerse, acercase. To draw near it is the acercase. Arco is a curve in their back they want to maintain. Arco. Um, a wide, a good base of support. Base de apoyo. Box, caja. A load, carga. Heavy objects or heavy things would be cosas pesadas or objetos pesados, heavy objects. Um, you're going to be telling them to avoid certain movements like twisting. So to twist is torcer. Next slide is some causes of back pain. So questions, ¿Qué son las cosas de dolor de espalda? So 
also things such as lifting heavy loads, levanto cargas, bending, in, inclinado, o doblando el cuerpo, bending the body, or twisting the body, torcer el cuerpo. Um, this slide says lifting education. I included this with the graphic in the next slide about proper lifting, um, and I put it in the clinic so that other therapists can use it at our lifting station to show the patient so that they can read it as well as when you're kind of demonstrating it to them to reinforce proper body mechanics. Um, so this translates, you can prevent or reduce back pain. Usted puede evitar or reducir dolor de espalda. So you're kind of telling the patient it's their responsibility, um, that they actually have some control over the level of their back pain based on, you know, proper movements that they're able to do and the education that you're going to give them. Um, it's important to stand with good posture. Es importante, parece con postura buena. Good posture um, also indicates maintaining the small curve in the low back when they're bending. So, postura buena es un arco pequeño de la cintura o de la espalda. So, as I mentioned in the previous slide, I put this graphic with the lifting education um, together on a sober document just to kind of help reinforce the proper bending and lifting. And it shows um, a man here lifting a box or crate. Then also shows a small picture of a woman lifting a child because I find um, whether whether a you know a parent is doing that in the home, they're lifting their child improperly because they were never taught how to do it properly, or maybe they work in daycare or some other child care profession where they're having to lift children and doing it improperly. So this um, tells you. Um, proper lifting mechanics. So it says, tres pasos para levantar objetos pesados correctamente. So three things and how to lift objects correctly. So, acerquese al objeto lo más que pueda. So you're keeping the object close. Doble la cadera y las rodillas. So you're bending the hips and the knees. And then, siempre levante con las piernas y no con la espalda. So you're always lifting with the legs and not with the back. So when you're showing it to a patient, you want to show how they're not bending over at the waist. They're kind of maintaining that curve in the low back when they're picking it up. And they're really relying on their legs for that support. Um, I like this next picture, which shows the back extension. Um, it has some instructions in Spanish. Um, I just find a lot of it um, is related. Um, the patients normally are limited in extension because they've been using bad posture when lifting and bending. So you kind of want to reinforce um, some of that extension when they are, um, you know, just with their daily exercise program. Or if they notice that they are sitting a lot or they're bending forward and they start to get that pain, you want to give them all this education to be able to manage their own pain and be able to see a positive difference. So this just instructs them, parece con las pies separados un poco. So stand and separate the feet a little bit. Ponga las manos atrás debajo de la cintura. To put the hands in the low back area. Mira adelante durante el ejercicio. So they're looking kind of straight ahead during the exercise. Um, doble la cintura atrás lo más que puede. Mantenga la posición por un segundo. So they're kind of bending back. At kind of that back where their hand is. And they're maintaining that position for a second. So that's Then they regrese al recto. And so then they're coming forward again. And then repeating where the veces más. So you're telling them to do this ten times. So it might be another helpful graphic to have in the clinic if you're having a hard time explaining it to a patient. Okay, the last slide is just some of the sources um, for the presentation, from my presentation, and um, adapted from the other the therapist there, Poland. So I just wanted to include those in case anyone wanted to look up anything further. Um, I hope this was a helpful presentation. Um, definitely adapt it to 
your own clinics and what's most beneficial for your um, Spanish-speaking patients coming in and what therapists feel comfortable with. Um, we found in our clinic that there was a good population um, of Spanish-speaking patients, so that this would be very helpful on a day-to-day -day basis to have um, some basic Spanish, some um, just some vocabulary that would be very helpful, some common phrases and questions we can ask the patient that will really help positively impact our care for them. All right, thank you.